So before I begin today, um, I'm going to talk about innovation and firsts um, for Remedy throughout the years. Our studio is, uh, is 20 years old this, um, this year, and it's an anniversary for us. So I'm going to look back a little bit at things that uh, we've learned throughout the years and then delve into those, hopefully as, as honestly and deeply as I possibly can. Um, before we get started with that, um, are there any specific topics that you'd like me to cover or specific areas of interest for you or anything like that? I, I'd love to, you know, just a show of hands, if you have something that you'd, you'd like to talk about today or go into, please raise your hand. We have that luxury here today. Anybody? Yes. Uh, future projects? Sure, let's talk about that. Something else? Well, raise your hand at some point if you have an idea or you want to delve into something, we'll go into it. And uh, yeah? Okay. Hello, I think hello. there was one, one more. Um, Work-life balance at Remedy. That's an important topic. Something else? Um, if uh, free to play is an issue for you right now. Okay. Thanks. because there was a nice article on Polygon, <laughs> if it's possible. Oh, okay, the, the Polygon stuff, Alan Wake 2 and prototypes, stuff like that, yeah, let's talk about that too. Okay, and one more, then we'll get going. Um, maybe the biggest mistake you made in the company? Okay, try to be honest about that one. I've made many, so it's like a selection. Smorgasbord of mistakes. Okay, so let's see if we touch upon these um, as I go through some of the slides and, and work. I think there's elements there that tie to these. If we don't cover it, then certainly let's, let's chat a little bit more about them after, after the slides end. So at Remedy, we really want to create games with character. So games that couldn't be made anywhere else. We all have those memories as a kid you know, when you've played a game, uh, but the memory stays with you for a long time. So for me, for example, um, playing, I don't know if any, anyone over here played like the old um, strategy king, uh, game Empire, where you could, you know, conquer worlds and, you know, it would crash, I would run out of memory on the 286, I think, and then I'd start all over again and play it. And those memories are vivid in my mind. Or Fighting Falcon 4, uh, hooking that up to uh, my parents' stereo system, stealing their comfortable chair, and I was, in, I was a pilot, pilot of, a, uh, of a F-16, and that, that felt really powerful and awesome. I played heavy metal music on top of the soundtrack and shoot Sidewinder missiles and felt really powerful. So those memories, you know, stick with you, or Wolfenstein, kind of first time it, it was really real, or, or playing the first um, kind of, or actually Sega Rally 2, I'd spend kind of all, a lot of my disposable income on to, onto those machines playing those, those games. So we want to create memories like that that last for a long time with our audience. So it's not just disposable uh, killing time exercises. And, and for, for us, um, a lot of that comes from exploration and the pleasure of finding things out. And frankly, there's, there's a natural curiosity that we all have as human beings and something that we want to nourish at Remedy. It's something that we want to really take care of and, and see fulfillment in. Exploration is a means, it, I mean, it's almost, it, it has a value in its own. A curious mind is a beautiful thing. Um, a dull mind, not so much. I'm going to talk a little bit about cockroaches, because as, as I said, um, it's been 20 years at Remedy. 
And one of the worst things that can happen to an organization or a person is that they start focusing on survival, not success. And you know, you take a few cuts, you get a few bruises, and you grow thick skin. That thick skin grows into an exoskeleton, and soon you don't need a spine or any principles, and you become a cockroach. So you're basically uh, just looking for survival and the next thing to do and, and going forward, as opposed to keeping your eyes open and looking for success. So I think that's my worst fear uh, in, in game development, is that you're not taking enough risks, you're not doing new things, and you're just kind of in a rut. And becoming a cockroach is, is probably the scariest and saddest thing uh, you can ever see. So um, I, I saw this slogan at Heathrow, maybe must have been like eight years ago, of one of the Emirate Airlines or the Gulf Area Airlines. It's a little cheesy, um, but actually got me thinking a lot, both as an organization, but also as an individual. When's the last time you've done something for the first time? I mean, something really new. Um, and that's one thing we ask ourselves at the, at the studio. If we're doing this game or we're doing this project, what does it really serve? Uh, what's kind of, is there something new there? Is there some purpose? So when we look at future projects, each one of them has to do something new. It can't be what we've done in the past. And I don't mean a little iteration, I mean it needs to open up some new doors and push the envelope further. So I'll talk a little bit about what we've considered first in our previous work, uh, and certainly want to talk more about that. But I think it's sure, certain to, sh uh, to say that we do have a certain recipe for a remedy game. They're cinematic, they're character-centric, they're based in the real world. Uh, we draw inspiration from popular culture, usually from outside of games. We look for elements that are uh, familiar. Uh, so kind of the all-American small town in uh, Alan Wake was very much a nod to Twin Peaks, Northern Exposure, and that kind of stuff. Max Payne was, was kind of our tip of the hat to John Woo and Hong Kong action. Uh, Quantum Break is a time travel mystery with kind of almost superpowers for the characters. Uh, and those are timeless elements. I think our future projects will also have timeless elements, hopefully stuff that hasn't been done in games, um, but is familiar to our audience. And hopefully we can do something new uh, in the art form. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about things we're doing there. But also as an individual, I think it's, it's really, really interesting um, to think about each year, when's, what's, the, what's kind of the, for this year, what's the new thing you're going to do, either professionally or in your private life? And I think those are um, interesting things to keep in mind. It's like a New Year's resolution, but one that's more driven towards some, some kind of personal growth. All right. So exploration, um, as I said, and the pleasure of finding things out, is, is a natural, natural trait. And each project has had one or two things that, that it drives further. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. I don't think we need to look at the, the market sizes and the global, global stuff. We all know that the games industry is growing. It's more fragmented. It's more interesting. But I think it's also the golden age in gaming many in many ways. We can create different kinds of experiences, different sizes of experiences. It all kind of makes sense. So let's take a look at kind of uh, down memory lane, and each I'll go, I'll go through, through kind of certain stages, and kind of talk about the firsts uh, in each one of these. So kind of um, the whole MVP terminology, obviously big, coming especially from mobile and free to play. I'd consider Death Rally or minimum viable product. It was done by 12 guys in a cellar. Um, and a top-down racer, kind of a fair, um, kind of a, a passion project, but also a project that got the studio started in many ways. And I think from that we learned to ship um, and close something. So when, we, when I came on board in 99, I looked through the safe and I swear there were six publishing contracts there for all kinds of games, ranging from a space uh, thing with self-learning AI and stuff like that to more kind of um, traditional games. But none of those games shipped. Death Rally was the first game that shipped, and that really got the studio started um, for various reasons. Um, but obviously, uh, from, from a studio perspective, you're defined by what you can get out there, not by the ideas and the ambitions you have. It's about closing and shipping stuff and getting it to the hands of customers. 
Max Payne, uh, in many ways, was more than a project. I mean, we built a game uh, that we were ill-equipped to build, uh, really. Uh, Twelve guys from the cellar doing a top-down racer to, hey, let's build a triple-A action game with story elements and some innovation. Really, that's a leap of faith. Um, we learned from that. It was our first triple-A action game. Um, we made a movie deal, or I made a movie deal, uh, in 2001. Um, how many have seen the film? Okay, I was young, I needed the money. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, I think we learned, I mean, more serious, we, we learned to contor control the intellectual property. And that's one of the things that Remedy do. I mean, we build our own intellectual property. That's one of the things that defines us. We want to create our own experiences. And we also built this wonderful uh, set of tools and technology called MaxFX. It even had multiplayer code in there, believe it or not. Uh, and we were looking at companies like id and Epic uh, for kind of reference points of what's a successful game company. And, and they, they were kind of the bleeding edge at that time. And we started building a tech that we would license. Unfortunately, we even had a licensing manager. Uh, we got to a stage where we realized that we don't actually want to be in the tech licensing business. Uh, and I think we learned what we're not as a company. Uh, doing a business to business service is very different to doing entertainment for the audience. So, okay, controlling your IP and knowing what business you're in or what business you're not is, it was a key learning for us. And obviously we, we really built the studio. I mean, the first six months, um, a lot of the process, a lot of the structure. I mean, the guys, you know, they didn't really have a cash flow forecast for the company. It was kind of scary. Uh, really, a lot of the basic in infrastructure got done in, in 99 uh, and 2000 uh, when we were building Max. So we, we really built the studio as well. Uh, Max Payne 2, a very different uh, kind of proposition. I mean, the first game took four and a half years to build, uh, and really a lot of the development processes weren't as refined as, as, as they could have been. It was the first sequel. Uh, it was done in 18 months and landed at an 87 Metacritic on the, on the PC. It was also our first intellectual property sale. So um, we sold the IP in 2002 to Take-Two Interactive, who was the publisher, and learned a lot from, uh, a lot from that. Um, in terms of work-life balance, this is a good moment to go into it. So Max Payne 2, um, for various reasons, not least of all, um, I don't know how many of you are, have invested into shares of publishers or looked at the stock of publishers, but obviously if your publisher has uh, a limited portfolio, uh, it's very key that you hit certain dates. Max Payne 2 was one of those products that it was really desirable to ship on a certain date for financial reasons. Uh, and had profound impact. So what we did was we pushed that puppy out. I mean, we built a game in 18 months. Uh, there was not a lot of work-life balance in that exercise. Um, I had to say it was very, very kind of a vigorous push to the deadline, and we didn't want to compromise on quality either. So that was kind of um, a hard, hard push in many ways. But one of the things we learned from there was uh, we also gave everybody uh, a guaranteed bonus at the end of it, and we gave them extra time off. Uh, so uh, I think we were all pretty much off for 10 weeks after that with a nice uh, sum of money. So we tried to compensate for that and it was clear to everybody that once the ships, this hits the date, you can go away, you can relax, you can take your family somewhere nice and warm and then kind of uh, come back and let's, let's do something there. Obviously that's a luxury not everybody has, um, but we had that luxury and we really put effort into, into making that, that happen as well. In terms of work-life balance, uh, we shut for July. It, it, Amer it drives Americans crazy. Uh, you know, we work with Microsoft, Rockstar, and those guys. I mean, so you know, we'll come over in July. Gonna, no, we're not here. Well, you know, you know, a week later, no, we're not here. Uh, you know, but you know, early July, no, we're not here. You don't understand. We shut for July. The entire studio closes. That's just the way we roll. It's much more efficient that way, and it's much more fun that way. Uh, work-life balance also. And this is more of a personal thing. Uh, because of the time zones and the partners we work with, you're usually having to work either very late or very early. Um, and four or five years ago, I wasn't very, very happy because um, you were doing a lot of calls and then you were working with a team and then kind of waiting in the evening to do some more business and talk about stuff. 
Um, and then I decided that this is not the way I want to roll. So what I did was I divided my day into, into certain slots. So in the morning, it's family time. We have breakfast together, uh, spend time with the kids. Then I go to work at a reasonably, um, a reasonable hour, like 9.30 or so. Do a no normal work day, come back home, and I have a slot for family time where I don't do work. Two to three hours, easy. Then again in the evening, once the Americans are kind of rolling and coming back for lunch, I'll do another slot of work. This is not a nine to five job, but you can also define some of your own rules of what you want to achieve. Not everybody does that, but obviously I think the higher up you go in the hierarchy, the more responsibility you have, I think the more you expect from people. Um, it's just the way it goes. But you can also kind of build systems that support that. Um, all the people who work uh, or report directly to me, uh, kind of the senior leadership, they can take as much time off as they want. It's like a Netflix model. So I don't care how many holiday days they have or haven't. If they can take time off and they want to take time off, they can take it off. And so I don't really count that. I don't know if that answers the work-life balance thing. It's about getting shit done. It's not about turning up. So that's, that's one of the things. So we learned the value of, of a franchise uh, with Max Payne 2. Um, and <clears throat> from, uh, from a creative standpoint, well, we learned not to kill your key cast. Because Sam had ridden Max Payne 1 uh, into a very bloody affair. And it turns out we killed pretty much everybody else <laughs> in the game. Doesn't make for an easy sequel. <laughs> so, oops. OK. Alan Wake. So, Actually, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, platforms here as well. So PC gaming is obviously doing really, really well now. Uh, but in 2001 to 2003, from Max Payne 1 to Max Payne 2, you guys know where I'm going with this. So the American market for PC games in 2001 was 1.5 billion. Uh, and then it dropped to 800 million in 18 months. So it went down by about half. What did we do? We didn't look outside. Uh, we kept on doing the same formula, because Max Payne 1 shipped first on the PC and then on the consoles. So we just repeated it for Max Payne 2. Unfortunately, you know, this thing, piracy and kind of internet sharing of stuff had kind of come along. There really wasn't, Steam hadn't really picked up. And that really hurt us on kind of the, um, the sales of the second one. Uh, obviously, you know, we should have hit all platforms at once or consoles first as opposed to being um, hurting uh, from that. So looking outside and looking at your platform mix and not just repeating what's been successful previously could be a good idea. Okay. So Alan Wake, um, I'm going to call it the second album syndrome. You know, bands have that. You know, one album is successful and then they go to the next. So we started off uh, with... Basically, for a small studio, like a 20, Max Paint 2 was 23, 24 people, I think. So we had a lot of money from the IP sale. Uh, those figures are public, so 43 million, and uh, then also some royalties and incentives shared between us and the producers. Um, and we had a lot of financial freedom. And we started building a lot of interesting technology and interesting things. It was the first game where we decided, Max Payne 1 and Max Payne 2 had been done after a film script uh, structure. So you have Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Now when you do that in a game, it actually stretches out a lot because a game is much longer than a film and it kind of becomes diluted. But when we took the TV script format, we would played with, we would watched, kind of, this was the moment when DVD box sets really broke kind of through. Uh, we'd consume like DVD box sets of Lost and you know, you trade, you know, and I'll buy this box it, and you'll buy that. And so we, we watched a lot of DVD uh, TV then. This was before like Netflix and, and HBO. So we built the game to have that structure, and it really, really worked well for a game. It provided natural pauses for the gamer, uh, and kind of we do that kind of thing in previously on or in tonight's episode, and then it would you know work work really well for storytelling. Uh, and then we have some really, really high um, completion figures on, on Alan Wake, among the most um, highest in, in, in games, I think. Because people could follow the story and they wanted to have closure on the story. Uh, it was our first console game um, and um, a kind of uh, a, a big jump for us also. 
The one thing we learned from this, and this is like if you don't take anything away, uh, else away from this session, is uh, fun is greater than innovation. I mean, just think about that. Innovation is not always fun. A lot of people talk about innovation like it's, you know, super sauce and the best thing ever. Innovation is lesser than fun. We create fun for people or emotionally engaging stuff for people. We're not here to innovate on everything. A lot of innovation is actually not fun at all. So we, we built a sandbox game um, uh, with Alan Wake, and then we had that in our hands about 2007, 2008. And we had moments where you had dramatic things happen, a love scene, you know, the characters would come together. Uh, it was supposed to be a tight scene uh, and you know, well-paced. And in an open world game, you know, the gamer would come and flying off with a monster truck down the mountain into the scene, going like da 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 da. It's, it wasn't anything like the experience we envisioned. So we had to reboot a little and go for a much more linear experience to have that thrill ride and pacing. Uh, it was innovative, but it wasn't really fun or didn't fit the vision. Now the other thing uh, that we learned was kind of the outsourcing failure. So we did everything pretty much by the textbook and we did it right. So in the beginning of the game, uh, Wake's wife goes missing and it becomes a key motive for the player to find his love interest and save, uh, save his wife. And, and kind of one of the opening scenes, they're talking in a car. Now, the first glimpse of that cinematic comes back from the outsourcing and we put it in engine. And it looks like, okay, um, it's, it's like a figure from Shrek when you look at the wife. And you, this is supposed to be like the biggest motive for the player. And the face is just like all plasticky, like, you know, like those Hollywood stars that put too much Botox in their face. And it's like, oh God. And you're looking at it, you're going, oh shit, we're screwed. And you know, what can we do? So we actually, we did five, uh, we asked bids for bids uh, from five different companies uh, for facial stuff. And we got you know, the, all these bids in. Uh, we looked at the quality. We kind of did, we didn't remove the names of the studios who had created stuff. And then you know, we looked at it and we selected the best one. And it was awesome. Unfortunately, when the amount of our cinematics came, they couldn't deal with the volume. It looks like you know, we had the A team do the test for us, but turns out the A team can't really hit your date and churn it out. So all of a sudden you're getting everybody and their uncle. Oh, I think they can animate you know, coming in. And that, then you get this kind of quality issue. So um, it's something that we already fixed for the, for the downloadable content for the game, um, but we couldn't really fix it for the original game. And we also learned the importance of a platform holder's support, love or lack thereof. So we shipped um, in 210, and we originally been slated for something earlier. We hadn't set a date for internally uh, or for them, uh, for Microsoft. But when we came out, um, Microsoft was focused very much on Kinect, and we didn't support Kinect at all. Um, and so we didn't get a lot of love, uh, for, no marketing really in TV and stuff like that. And that really didn't help us too much. Um, so in, in games, there are three strategies for success uh, that I can document and know. One is to have a portfolio. Um, so basically, not everything needs to work out. Two things out of seven work, you're awesome. Uh, the other is to have strong relationships uh, with platform holders or key partners so you can weather the storm and go forward. And the third one is to be lucky. And the third one's not really a strategy. Um, but I'm still stunned by the amount of um, studios that are kind of following, oh, we'll do the next Flappy Bird. And I'm kind of going, okay, that's, that's a black swan event. It's not a strategy. It's like chasing a black swan into the red ocean, I guess. Anyway. Next, American Nightmare. So, wow. Uh, we wanted to do something uh, different and self-publish something and do something digital and small and get something done. In, in a, uh, I think emotionally we needed to do a shorter project. Um, so we changed our strategy and we, we decided to do something incremental and quick. Uh, it was our first XBLA game. It was our first self-published Steam game. And I think we learned a lot of discipline from that. What can you put in? What can't you put in? Oh, these cinematics will take too long. Can we put in live action? Can we do this? Stuff like that. We already did some of this with Max Payne 1. We didn't have money for cinematics or the capacity to do them, so we put in kind of these comic strips, like graphic novels, and put post-processing or kind of little effects on them. 
And it, I think it actually worked a lot better than, than the cinematics in the day. So you can have two kinds of innovation. One is slack innovation, and one is constrained innovation, where you really need uh, to push, push the envelope forward. We learned a lot about self-publishing, and we also learned that open ecosystems are better than closed ones. Uh, on Steam, being able to do promotions and being able to kind of um, play with price and stuff like that is, is, is really uh, powerful. XBLA is you know, a great platform and it's convenient, but you really get your sales in the beginning of the cycle and it doesn't really behave like Steam uh, commercially on the longer term. And I think that applies to uh, pretty much any ecosystem these days. The more open it is, the better it is for, for the talent. Okay, uh, we also took Alan Wake to PC, and we learned a lot from American Nightmare. Uh, and it was our first, we did a deal with a retailer directly as well. And we learned a lot about the price elasticity of demand. Um, you know, it's not a sexy topic, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So <clears throat> we took um, the offer, I mean, Humble Bundle. How many of you know Humble Bundle? Uh, okay, everybody, cool. So. We wanted to do a good thing at some point, and let's do a humble bundle for charity and, and help certain, uh, and let's essentially give the game out for free. And we had a lot of downloads from that. Like, a lot of people gave to charity and gave to us, uh, and it was really heartwarming. So we kind of thought that, you know, now we've pumped out everything and we're done with this game. There's no real revenue to come from here. Well, it turns out our friends at Valve really liked what we were doing. They liked the game, and I think they appreciated what we'd done. So the next weekend, uh, they did a special campaign, and they dropped the price. So the previous first weekend, you could have bought it essentially for free or for a dollar or something. And then the second weekend, we had a price attached to it. And you know, the logical, you know, logic in your mind goes, you're not going to do any sales on the second weekend, because they could have gotten it for free the previous. It was our third biggest sale, uh, sales weekend ever. Uh, it, the laws are, are very different in digital. Uh, we, we had tremendous revenue. You know, that month was a, was a great quarter, and that weekend was a good month. So uh, it, was, it was really, really nice, uh, and that's all, all I can kind of say for, for that. I mean, the, some of the laws and logic are, are, is a little different. Okay. So we also built... Um, Death Rally for, for iOS. We wanted to experiment with that, uh, with, a, with a local developer. And we took our first game and we put it there. Uh, it, we also wanted to produce an external project and we worked uh, with, with an external team. Uh, and it was really interesting to see. Um, uh, it was the first kind of game that was featured at launch by Apple ever. So before, it, prior to that, Apple would let games be in the market and then see how they're doing and then feature them. We came out of the gates. Uh, they, they were fans of core games and they supported us and featured it. And I think today we have like 16 million downloads of Death Rally. It was number one in 70 countries. So this is the time before you know all the free-to-play stuff really hit the market and you're really making money. But it was it was really good. And once you combine an open ecosystem and platform holder support, you're doing well. But, okay, maybe they recognized uh, that they also wanted certain types of games that weren't there, so maybe differentiation is a, is a key learning there as well. Uh, I think for games, uh, as, as with anything, uh, you can really, any form of entertainment, you only have two types of bets that you make. Um, so one's a IP bet, you're betting on the intellectual property, Star Wars, anyone, so that's cool. Uh, or uh, you're betting on the talent. You never make a category bet. Uh, the amount of people with money who are looking to publish games who are making category bets is really, really scary. The first time you go into a meeting and somebody says, well, you know, we're looking for something in casino and then perhaps something in strategy and, you know, something mid-core and then we have this slot for casual. That's really, really scary. You shouldn't be making bets like that at all. I mean, you should either be betting on the talent of the team or the IP that you have. Never in a category. It's recipe for disaster. That's something we've certainly learned. Okay, technology, Northlight. So Northlight is our future tech, uh, and it's something that we're really, really excited about. So for us, uh, we're deploying kind of digital doubles uh, of, the, of the actors, and some really, really cool film-grade VFX. So 
On, on Quantum Break, we've had um, two Oscar winners uh, from the film side, one on Gravity and one for the Golden Compass. I like Gravity better than Golden Compass. Uh, and uh, kind of that's, uh, that's, that's something kind of, we're getting to the, to the edge of the technology where a lot of the stuff that's used in film or it can now be done in real time. And it's really, really cool. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, so basically, I mean, I think everybody has kind of this smorgasbord of the rendering effects, like, you know, physically based rendering, uh, some cool ambient occlusion stuff and some clever stuff there. And that, yeah, that's cool. Um, but on the character side, uh, what we're doing with Quantum Break is we're, we're kind of releasing a, let's say, a, a live action show where we have actors, and we're, you know, like a TV show, and the game, and they come together. So in the game, you'll play. Um, the heroes, and in the TV show, you'll see the villains. Often the villains in modern contemporary TV are much more interesting than the heroes. Like think of House of Cards, Breaking Bad, Sopranos, any one of the, like the, like the bad guys are more, more interesting than the good guys, if you have any good guys. And we kind of take a look at them. So at the end of each episode of the game, you get to make a choice of which future comes to pass, and in the TV show, you'll get your director's cut based on your choice. And Kind of then you watch the show, you come back to the game. So we're doing both together. We just finished uh, shooting in Atlanta uh, on the same set where they shoot The Walking Dead uh, for the TV show. So for that to work, you need digital doubles because you're going to see somebody live on TV, essentially. And then you're also going to see them in game. So we built tech to do that. And some of the stuff we do um, is process innovation and some of it is technical innovation. Um, and we basically scan the person, uh, the actor, with a with system, system we've built, custom built, uh, Remedy. It was a Skunk Works project, and it still looks a little bit like a mad science experiment, uh, but it actually works. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cool stuff there. So what we're doing is we're shooting 26 off-the-shelf digital cameras in one go when the actor sits down, and that creates a very, very high detailed mesh that 11 PCs bake and it goes into the build. Then we also use kind of uh, surface capture for delivery of the face. So we get the micro movement, um, like everything that you possibly couldn't animate, like those little things in, in characters. Uh, and that really just comes from, from the data. We have nine cameras shooting 100, I think it's 100 or 60. Yeah, it's, it's probably 60 frames a second. And then that comes out with massive data. We compress that with some clever algorithms and we get a one-to-one -one performance delivery from the character. Then we also have uh, helmet-mounted cameras for doing cinematics, and we get the face together. Not as high quality as we do with the nine cameras, but pretty darn good. So that's something that we put a lot of effort into, emotionally engaging characters uh, for, for tech. And that's something I'm excited about for the, for the future stuff. Uh, I mean, we can all, all go into the graphics porn arm race of, you know, it's doing this and this and this. But if you can really deliver an emotionally engaging actor uh, and you know, do that, then I think that's really cool. Because that just opens up more subtleties for storytelling. Because a lot of the time, you know, we still had to hide, hide the camera with cuts and stuff like that. But with this tech, we're able to do that. And for that to be efficient, uh, we also have certain tools. One's called a timeline editor that allows us to place cameras by hand and virtually into the space. And we also do a kind of like depth of field, and so it's all customary to, custom tools that we do, do. And we can kind of just tweak the lighting, camera angles, and everything. And then what's cool is because they're all kind of done, uh, the actors have done their acting, we have a motion capture room in our studio, and the director can go in there uh, without any of the actors any, being present anymore. He'll just drive a camera through the scene, and he can change it and hand hold it, and he sees it from his camera, like a virtual camera, how it looks on screen for the gamer. So you can also play with that, which is really, really cool. Uh, and because it's all virtual, you can also change the scale. You can go one to two, one to four, so you're really farther away from a big scene or really close. And all of that is happening in those proprietary tools. And that's the kind of like the geek factor. Like it's very hard for um, mainstream folks to kind of get into that. But once they see it, then they kind of get it. Oh, the actors aren't here, but it's like he's filming them. So it's wow. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, okay, Agents of Storm, uh, we, uh, 
launched this with uh, good partners from Flare Games here in Germany. It was our first real serious bet into mobile uh, internally done. It was our first strategy game. It was our first free-to-play game. It was the first back-end and analytics we ran. Uh, and frankly, we, we learned a lot from that uh, as well. And running kind of a game as a service in, in this business model learned a lot. I think the data and the shorter increments of development are some things that we will benefit from uh, on the long term in all our projects. Kind of seeing more data from how people are playing, how often they're playing, what's happening. I think that's increasingly coming as games become more and more games as a service. Um, so we already talked a little bit about the tech and, 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 and quantum break. Um, the transmedia side, to be fair, um, is there anybody in this room that's seen a good implementation of transmedia in games? Yeah, neither have I, so we're going to try. <laughs> uh, it's a first. And if we can pull it off, I think that'll be really, really cool for the art form uh, as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's a big, audacious goal, but to, I think it's easier to get motivated to try to do something that's pretty hard or hasn't been done before than it is to come back and try to just rinse and repeat what's already been done. In the future, future projects, um, I see that we're going to have multiple pistons. Uh, we're going to do more. We're hopefully going to uh, kind of go across from project to project and, and have quicker learning and hopefully kind of have, uh, have a larger studio as well. But for us, I mean, it's never been about size. We've always been fairly small. Um, I think, you know, obviously it's a, it's a large quote uh, and it's hard to live by. But I think it's setting your, yourself also up to, to aim for the stars and to go high enough and try to achieve that. There's nothing um, sadder than uh, a studio or, or the leadership of a studio or a developer who aim for mediocrity and achieve it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think aiming a little higher, and even if you fail a little bit, is a much better position to be at uh, than, than anything else. So let's go through a little bit of ground that I haven't touched. Um, so we talked a little bit about future projects and stuff there. Tech, uh, it's hard not to talk about. It's exciting. Uh, Work-life balance, yes. Um, OK, free to play. Um, I think free to play is a business model among other business models, uh, and clearly the one that works on mobile right now. Um, there's some ad-driven stuff that doesn't uh, does work as well. Um, so I think that's that's very true. I think on the big screen, uh, I don't really, for me, ultimately, it doesn't matter whether it's free to play or it's a game as a service. I think that's more interesting. You know, it can be a service in the way that Telltale do their stuff. You're doing dropping more episodes, or uh, our friends at Starbreeze running payday and doing constant drops of content, or a world of tanks where you obviously have, have a free-to-play experience. I think all of those are, are perfectly fine. Obviously, they have big design choices, but I think it's more interesting. Essentially, you're running a service. Um, and for us, we already did that a little bit with, with Wake. We had two uh, downloadable content, DLC packs, come. But our production wasn't really geared to do quick drops, like one and a half hour drops. Uh, there. So if you built your pipelines, your processes a little different, you could obviously do more episodic stuff or, or follow up with stuff. Um, Wake 2, um, that's, there's certainly been a lot of uh, stuff uh, in, in, on the internet now um, in the past few days. We shared some, some prototypes uh, from 2010 where we were building and concepting where the franchise would go next. Um, I think we were a little uh, awestruck and, and uh, surprised by how much <laughs> attention it got. We kind of thought, okay, we'll show concept art and stuff that we did. And all of a sudden, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of talk. Um, the timing wasn't right at that point in time to, to go forward with the project. And Sam's already talked about that uh, publicly, our creative director. Uh, and we're focused on Quantum Break now. Uh, but obviously, Wake is, a, is something we own and something we've built. And at some point, hopefully, we'll, we'll return to that. Uh, mistakes, God, I've made many. Um, so um, let's put it this way. Um, and uh, Mike Caps, who is uh, the used to be the president of Epic, is is on our board, uh, and he, you know, he did his pep talk uh, to me some time back related to a project. He kind of comes to you. And he's, he's a very smart guy. He looks me in the eye, and goes like, Matthias, uh -oh. failures are part of the process, but failing slowly is not. And 
kind of go like, okay, how long does it take you to get to failure and to a dead end is really, really critical. As fans and kind of our natural inclination, the remedy kind of DNA is to persevere and push forward and push forward and push forward. It's not a fail fast culture. We just push through, we do long projects, we want to do quality. We don't do MVP, we just push. Whereas in certain areas, we could learn a lot from smaller studios and, and kind of folks working on mobile stuff. And, and we have learned to fail quicker and do sloppy prototypes as opposed to try to polish something and keep on polishing it. There's a time for that, but uh, I think we've, we could fail quicker. I think that's, that's one of the mistakes. And certainly I've been party to that, that not allowing us to fail and just pushing forward. Um, and, and demanding a lot from myself and others when we should have just failed and done something different. So that's one thing. Um, uh, kind of, I think also looking at uh, structures internally uh, and, and studio, studio wide, I think it's better to have over clarity in who's responsible for what. And I think somewhere there, where we've had shared responsibility or communal responsibility, we've had failures and stuff has taken too long and hasn't, hasn't gotten done or has been unclear. And that causes friction or, or doesn't get stuff done. So I think clarity in organization is, is certainly, certainly a key thing. Um, that's a lot, of the, a lot of the ground I wanted to cover today, but we, we have some time. If, if you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to add color. Uh, this is really about you know, trying to be as open as possible. So i just shoot. Anybody? Oh, there's somebody there. Thank you. Um, uh, when you speak about Uncanny Valley, um, what detail are you uh, going to put into the eyes of the of the people? Because scanning the skin is one thing, but the eyes, I think, it's mostly where uh, yeah. <laughs> characters look like yeah, some plastic doll or something. Yeah, and that, that's difficult. And um, we have some, some stuff there that we think will, will work. Um, but the proof's in the pudding. And the next time we go public, um, uh, you'll probably see some of that in action. And you can tell me, is it, is it good enough? I know it's very high level for what games have today, but on one hand, that's a scale of poverty. I mean, we need to do better as an industry for, for that to work, really. So we are pushing that. Um, I think the eyes are one thing, and then once you have really realistic characters, the AI becomes more and more important. So then you kind of, the AI is the next bottleneck. But I think all of these are imminently solvable things uh, and really cool, cool ground to cover. First of all, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Appreciate it. Um, how do you look back on the IP sale? Was it a really great decision, or do you, you know, regret it in some ways? I, I think it was it was absolutely the right decision, uh, and it was uh, a good move from us. So basically, um, with Max Payne, we had partners with uh, Rockstar and Take Two had certain publishing rights. Great people, Sam Hauser, those guys, awesomely talented, dedicated. Then we had kind of the veterans, uh, Scott Miller and, and George Broussard in Texas, the Apogee guys, like Duke Nukem and, and what have you. And then we had us in Finland. And you kind of, everybody had certain stakes into it. And frankly, as an independent studio of like 20 people, doing that gave us financial freedom to do what we want next. And that's, that's part of the reason why we've been able to be around for 20 years and to continue to create and take some risks. I mean, it's easy to say, go take some risks if people you know, if you can't put a stake on the table, it's very hard to gamble, right? Uh, so um, we've been lucky to have enough chips in our pocket to go, go there and, and play. Um, so yeah, absolutely, the IP sale uh, was, was necessary and, and, and good to do. Here we go. Um, yeah, well, uh, to bring it back to the topic of exploration, um, um, do you think that maybe the story development uh, will uh, change in the future as well in the, in the games industry? Or um, does it have to go always uh, to play one character, one side of the story? Is there any plans in your studio to, to develop the story in a different way? 
That, that's a really good question. Uh, we Obviously, any approach you have uh, has trade-offs. So what we try to do in quantum, um, quantum brick is to tell one story uh, and really, really well. I mean, there are certain choices you make and they have impacts, but it really is one story told many ways rather than you know a branching tree forever. The, um, the difficulty with um, branching story is that you quickly have 64 stories that are you know, not as good as focusing on one or two that are, are defining. And that's just the way, you know, kind of it's a trade-off. Then again, what is story? I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff, kind of more indie, kind of, um, that you're just telling a lot with visual storytelling or emergent stuff or user-generated content. So I think there's interesting stuff that, that can happen uh, by releasing tools and pipelines. So, you know, we're not in, in that state now, um, nor do we have any concrete plans, but it would be really, really nice if we could release tools for the community and, you know, stuff that they could do, maybe not as high fidelity, but they could create their own stories. And I think something like that would be really, really nice to do, because, I mean, then you'd have everybody being a storyteller, uh, and the best will emerge. Like, like in anything, uh, any form of entertainment, anything, like, we all know that 90% of everything's shit, but you'll get the 10% that's really, you know, great. Uh, and, and that's with any mod and anything out there. So I think it'd be really nice. Sorry, that's not terribly inspirational, is it? 90% of everything. Yeah. It kind of is. Open the TV. <laughs> okay. I think we're done for today. Uh, thank you all for your time. I really appreciated this. Um, have a nice sunny day in Berlin. Thank you.